All right, let's go ahead and open up to John 3. I'll just say for the, the people who see on YouTube uh, or internet or via audio or whatever, if there's some other way, uh, that if you'd like to be on our Bible study newsletter, it's called Bold to Speak the Mystery. Uh, it comes out a couple times a week. It's just short uh, review articles uh, and uh, some articles that go into more depth than some of the things we teach in the class here. Uh, you can just send me an email at biblestudygbcrm at gmail.com and we can add you to the list. Okay, let's go ahead and open up to tonight's message, the lifting up of Jesus. That's down in verse, uh, we're going to work our way down to verse uh, 12 and 13 here. Uh, but before we do that, let's just get to our minds. It's been a week. I warned you in my email that there was going to be one slide here that might be a little difficult uh, to read and you should print it out. Hopefully some of you did that if you have trouble reading this. Uh, because I tried different color schemes and shrinking the size to make it all fit and nothing worked. So we'll just work our way through this. This is just review, so this should sound very familiar to us. Uh, we're going to be down and really beginning down in verse 11, down through verse 16 tonight. But it's a good idea to at least remember what we did from Romans, excuse me, from John 1, uh, really from John 2.23 2, 2, to John 3. Uh, to 310. And that is that seeing and entering the kingdom. Uh, today we equate being born again uh, equals getting saved, individual personal salvation, justification under God. Uh, we had a, a famous president years ago uh, who used to talk about he was born again. And he meant that he, at least in whatever, however he uh, thought of that, he was saved. Uh, and that's what they called saved. And that's fine. You know, we're, language is malleable. Uh, as long as we all understand what he's talking about. The important thing we need to understand, though, is that's not what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. The born again, we saw as we went through this passage, needs to be looked at not in the light of Paul, but in the light of the Old Testament. And we went through it. This is just a review, so I just put this all up. Uh, a couple people I had sent this to said they found it very helpful, so I thought I'd include it in the slides tonight. Uh, John 3 gives us this seeing and entering, the, it's, a, it's important to realize he's not talking about spiritual salvation, a spiritual kingdom, uh, a right relationship with God or anything like that uh, primarily. He's talking about how Israel, what needs to happen for Israel as a nation uh, to enter into, to see and enter the kingdom, a literal physical kingdom in a literal physical land of, uh, in the Middle East uh, with Christ sitting on his literal physical throne in the literal physical Jerusalem, a literal kingdom. And we saw that uh, the, the type or the picture of this is that the first Exodus, when Israel was born the first time uh, back in the Exodus account, uh, and we went through all that in great detail, but that uh, how they entered the land, that's what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about. Just as Israel had to see and enter, the, believe in his name, see and enter the land, uh, the promised land, which of course is also the land that's going to be the kingdom, uh, the headquarters at least of the kingdom. Uh, and uh, we saw there the example of what those who could not see the kingdom, uh, if we, as we go through here, uh, the not believing in his names and the example there as the bulk of the nation really, but we especially looked at the 10 spies. Uh, they went into the land and they didn't see the kingdom. Uh, they went into the land. Uh, when they went and looked at the rivers, they were just flowing with water like everyone else's rivers. Uh, when they went into the land, they looked at the giants and the enemy nations and they said they're too powerful for us. Uh, we have to do this ourselves, uh, and so they're gonna, we shouldn't go in because they're too powerful for us. They couldn't even see the promised land. They couldn't even see uh, that, and that's because they didn't believe in his name. Therefore, uh, they weren't born of God, didn't have spiritual eyes to see. They went into the land and they didn't see the promised land. Uh, they just saw the enemies there. Uh, they saw uh, the giants there, and so they can't see it, uh, and of course, if you can't see it, they also couldn't enter it, uh, and uh, they aren't going to participate in that uh, in that uh, kingdom that in the promised land. There, once they enter the kingdom, that whole first generation, they're just going to die in the wilderness. 
physical death. Then you had the other two spies, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, and they went into the same land that the other 10 spies went into. But you know, when they looked in the rivers, you know what they saw? They didn't see just running water like everyone else's rivers. Those rivers in the promised land were running with milk and honey. And when they looked uh, at the giants, they saw the giants, they saw the enemy nations there, but you know what else they saw? They saw God's hand swooping down and destroying them. The Lord's hand swooping down. They say, and they said, and by the way, did we mention that it takes two people, two grown men, to carry a cluster of grapes in the land? And what did they say? They came out and said, let's go in. The Lord will do it all for us. They believed in the name of the Lord. They fell on the grace resident in his Jehovah name. They could actually see the kingdom, see the promised land. Uh, they could uh, see then through a faithful activity, that faithful report uh, to the nation of Israel about the land. They, could, they were the only two in the whole first generation that could enter into the land. And they could participate uh, in the restoration of Israel, the planting of Israel in the land. And then you had Moses, who certainly he believed in the name of the Lord uh, and could see the kingdom. Two accounts uh, give in Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, Numbers and Deuteronomy. One, he goes and looks at the, at the, uh, the land naturally, just with his physical eyes, and he sees the land. Uh, and the kingdom. And the second time, he, God takes him up on a hill and shows him the greater kingdom supernaturally. And he sees way more than you could see with the natural eye. He can see it, but because of an unfaithful act, uh, he doesn't enter it. And see, that's what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about. He's showing them how they're going to be able to enter into the literal, physical, uh, earthly land of Israel at Christ's second coming. Just as the nation was born the first time, and after those 40 years of wilderness wanderings, they were brought to the border of the land, uh, they needed to enter into the land, the promised land. The promised land is the same land that's going to be the headquarters of the kingdom. Now at their second exodus, at the end of that tribulation period when Christ returns, their second birth, you see the terminology from John 3, uh, the Lord's going to usher them in uh, to that kingdom. Uh, and he, what we've seen going from verse 3 to verse 5 to 6 to verse 7 to 8, uh, he's, and really we should begin at verse 223, we're assuming Nicodemus is one of those people that believed in his name. And according to John 1, 12 and 13, those who believe in his name become the children of God. Uh, and what are the children of God? The born ones of God. And born ones of God have the spiritual eyes to see the kingdom, to see the king, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to see the kingdom. And we know Nicodemus sees the kingdom. He says, I know you have God with you. I know that God is with you. I know uh, that God is with you. And what was the other one he said here? He said uh, I, that he's come from God. God sent him. And, you know, sometimes people ridicule Nicodemus's response. Uh, and uh, I actually, after my article, I think I sent that out on Monday, uh, on last Thursday's message, someone humorously got back to me after he saw my presentation on Nicodemus, and he said he thought we ought to start a GoFundMe page uh, to defray the cost of, of uh, fixing up Nicodemus's reputation. And I thought that was kind of humorous. Maybe you'll think it's humorous too, uh, because Nicodemus kind of gets a bad rap. It's like the bar is set way farther, higher than higher for him than anyone else. He knows that God is with him, and he knows that he's sent from God. In this very chapter and throughout the whole, book, uh, the whole Gospel of John, Jesus is going to describe himself over and over as one sent from God and one who God is with. Uh, in this very chapter, just a few verses later, he's going to say, the Son of Man is with God in the heavens, and that would imply the Father's with the Son, with the Son. Uh, and right after that, he says that the Father sent me, the Father gave me. Nicodemus recognizes something about Jesus. Uh, that, and it's the, it's, I think he's at a good part starting point. He's saying what Jesus is going to say about himself throughout the whole entire book. He's sent of God, and God is with him. 
Uh, and so I think uh, Nicodemus gets a bad rap in most of these. Uh, I think we set a test for Nicodemus that even us today with far greater resources, a complete strict uh, scripture in 2,000 years to think about it, we couldn't pass the test that we set for Nicodemus. I think he recognizes, I think he sees uh, Jesus, he recognizes he's someone God is with and he's sent from God. Can he explain it all and all the details and everything? No, uh, but I think that's uh, he can see that kingdom. He has a spiritual eyes to see the kingdom. He's justified unto eternal life before God. All individual personal sins forgiven. Then in verses 5 and 6, he goes to the next step. Did Moses just want to, was Moses just happy seeing the kingdom? No. What did Moses want? He wanted to not only see the kingdom, he wanted to enter the kingdom. Uh, but he wasn't allowed. So now that comes to the second point Jesus makes with Nicodemus. Uh, okay, Nicodemus, it looks like you can see me. Uh, and uh, now you don't want to just see the kingdom, you want to enter it. Well, now, uh, just as uh, Joshua and Caleb had a specific uh, faithful act to carry out, and Moses had a specific faithful act to carry out, the believing remnant in Jesus' day has a specific faithful act to, to, uh, to carry out has nothing to do with their individual personal salvation, justification unto eternal life, forgiveness of individual personal sins. That's already done. And if you want to understand how God can do that, you have to read Paul, Romans 3. He's talking about something else here. He's talking about entering into the kingdom. Uh, now uh, that they can that they have been justified, they can see the king in the kingdom. Now they enter and, and they, the faithful act uh, that began in Jesus' day for that believing remnant is for them to go through, be brought through, be born of water and the spirit. Uh, and that's, that's reference to water and spirit baptism. That uh, national cleansing and repentance program for national Israel. They've already got their individual personal sins forgiven, but what they don't have forgiven, because they're associated with Israel, because they were born into Israel as an Israelite, is the uncleanness associated with being a part of an apostate nation. While they have their individual personal sins taken care of, they're still associated with Israel's national debt of sin. We've talked about this many times. National debt of sins, they need uh, to have that removed. And that's, begin, that's what uh, water baptism and spirit baptism is a picture of what the Lord himself, we read in Ezekiel 36, is going to do at his return. They can, are given this faithful act now where they can engage in water baptism uh, and receive, uh, once after, at Pentecost, after the death and resurrection of Christ, and receive the Spirit. Christ baptized them with the Spirit at Pentecost. And for the next seven years, remember, as far as they know, there's no dispensation of grace. Uh, the next thing on Daniel's time schedule uh, after the, the one year around Pentecost uh, is that seven-year tribulation period. Uh, and they just go on into that. And I'm not considering if there's a little gap uh, for world to organize itself or whatever. I'm just moving right on to the seven year uh, period. And now so they can have be a picture for the next, what, eight, nine, ten years, uh, maybe 20 at most. Uh, I personally think it would be weeks or months. Uh, but whatever it is, in a very short amount of time, they can be being a picture, a type, I guess is what you'd call, of what the Lord's going to do at his return through water baptism, begins with John's baptism and Jesus' baptism through his disciples, goes on to Peter's baptism after, at Pentecost after his death and resurrection, and advances with Christ baptizing with the Spirit in early Acts. They can do that. Now, they don't know about the dispensation of grace. They don't know that Israel's going to reject their king and savior. And they could just keep on going through this water baptism, spirit baptism, through the tribulation, being a picture of what the Lord himself is going to do that we read about in Ezekiel 36. When the Lord returns, he's going to gather that believing remnant. What's he going to do? He's going to sprinkle them with clean water to cleanse them from all association with is the apostate Israel's national debt of sins that's been accruing over five courses of punishment. 
He's going to separate the believer, remember, cleanse them, separate them uh, from Israel's national debt of sin. And that ties in with giving the spirit because he's going to give them the spirit so they never uh, accrue a national debt of sin again. He can be, they can be planted in the land and become a debt-free nation. That's the provision of the new covenant. Uh, and it's their national forgiveness. And so he can have a debt-free nation that he can turn into the greatest nation in the world uh, that through that can sanctify his name and through them take his name out to the Gentile nations, thereby achieving what it says in verse 16 here, thereby saving the world. That's what he's talking about with saving the world. So that leads us right up through this. is all stuff uh, that should be familiar. Uh, I guess we didn't talk about the last one here, 7 and 8. That's Ezekiel 37, uh, the first half of Ezekiel 37. The wind, the spirit, God's spirit is going to blow over them. He's going to raise them out of their Gentile gra graves. He's going to call them to himself. He's going to give them life again, those dry old bones. And he's going to make of them that great nation, restore the nation uh, with that believing remnant, debt-free of national debt nation, plant them in the land where they can become the great nation. Now there's one thing I want to point out, and we're going to leave Ezekiel, uh, but we're going to come back to Ezekiel. So everyone needs to keep this in mind. Remember the, the uh, born of, of God, the new birth, the, the uh, born again concept uh, especially comes up uh, and sanctifying his name, believing in his name, especially in the first half of Ezekiel 36. We covered that in the past. Then, born of water and the spirit, that especially is talked about in Ezekiel, the last half of Ezekiel 36. See the progression here? The first half of 36, uh, Ezekiel 36. The second half of Ezekiel 36. Then you get to verses 7 and 8, and that's referring back, that refers Nicodemus back to the first half of Ezekiel 37. We've talked about that, but here I just want to leave you with this. Maybe some people want to look ahead. Uh, 37, this is the first half of Ezekiel 37. What does that mean? That means there's a second half, right? There's another, another half to Ezekiel 37, and I'll just throw this out and leave it here till we get there, but guess uh, where John is going to use the last half of Ezekiel 37. He's going to use it in John 4. The next chapter uh, is going to bring in the last half of 37. So in these two chapters, he's going to go through, uh, through uh, Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37 uh, step by step. Uh, and uh, for the reader, we need to be cognizant of that. All right. So that's just the overview there. Uh, and now let's pick it up at verse... 11. Verse 11. We speak, let's see, we, uh, we, uh, let's see, where are we? Verse 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, there's that verily, verily again, we talked about that, that would immediately, it doesn't take us back to the Psalms because we are, you know, not us specifically, but in general are so ignorant of our scriptures. I'd say that on the other, the other slide too. We don't see Ezekiel 36 and 37 in this. So we assume Nicodemus wouldn't have seen it either. Well, that's just nonsense. Uh, just because we don't see these things because we're completely ignorant for the most part of our old, especially our Old Testament scriptures. Uh, doesn't mean Nicodemus went. Remember, he's a Pharisee. He's, uh, he's part of a group that claimed to be the expert of the Old Testament. And they may not have interpreted it right or understood it right, but they would have been familiar with these passages. Uh, they would have committed them to memory. They would have taught them. They would have been learning them since, being, uh, since the infancy. Uh, they'd be familiar with these things. So we can't say because we don't see it immediately when we read the passage that that means it's not there. Uh, Jesus is leading Nicodemus step by step back to the Psalms. Uh, that broadcast the Davidic covenant, uh, tell, and that tells us how God, tells Israel, how God is going to save the nation of Israel, na Israel's national salvation program. He takes us back to the Exodus account and the entrance in the land. He takes us back to Ezekiel 37. Uh, and here we have verily, verily, that takes us back to those Psalms. I say unto thee, we speak that we do know. 
and testify that which we have seen. So now we get a little change. We get the we. Remember, we've gone uh, from ye. Uh, he gets to the ye. Let's look at where that is in verse 7. First, he's talking in singular. He's really not talking to Nicodemus in particular. He's just talking, he, our King James here says, uh, a man be born, or, or uh, verse three, uh, say unto thee, except a man be born. Uh, we could put in there, because you know, man, it can be a generic term. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean a male. Uh, it could be mankind, or we might just substitute in something like uh, no one uh, or one or something like that. Uh, and now he goes from that singular and he goes to ye in verse 7. Marvel not that I said that ye must be born again. It's not about Nicodemus or really any individual. What it's about is y'all, the whole group. Uh, y'all, uh, I guess if we're going to use uh, our southern dialect, that's, a, that's one of the a major advantage of our King James Version is that it, uh, in those days you differentiated between singular you and plural you. Ye is plural you. Now we don't do that today. We have to depend on context. So we just say you, whether it's singular or plural, uh, and you, from context you usually can figure that out. Uh, maybe if we were in the south it would be a little easier because what do they say down there? Y'all? That's kind of like ye. Uh, it's referring to the whole group. Uh, so he's not talking specifically about Nicodemus here. Now he says, when he says ye, he says they all must do this. And he's talking about the we here uh, and this ye concept. Uh, and uh, it's important to realize he's talking about the whole nation. When he says ye or ye all, y'all, uh, he's referring uh, to the group as a whole. And of course, specifically, it's going to be the re religious leaders that uh, Nicodemus is a part of. But more importantly, it's the, really the whole nation. As the leaders go, so too go the nation. Uh, and so that ye is referring to a group. He's not saying there uh, that they're all rejecting him. They're just saying the group as a whole is rejecting him. Every single person, every individual in the group may not be rejecting him, like Nicodemus here, uh, but uh, the group as a whole is rejecting him. Uh, and so now we, and that's going to switch again here to we, and so the question is, who is the we? Uh, and uh, we have to look at least at John the Baptist and Jesus. That would be we. We read about J John the Baptist's witness, Jesus' witness, perhaps the disciples, uh, they've given a little bit of a witness here. So you could have that, that we. That's what uh, most commentators that I have on hand were kind of indicated. But I'd stretch it back also to the first chapter of John uh, where we read, in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, and so he talks about this communion with the Father and communion within the triune Godhead. So I think all those things can come into play here. And of course, it was God the Father that talked to John the Baptist and told him who to look for, to look for the Son. Uh, and so I think you have this whole group here that could fit into the we uh, concept. John the Baptist, perhaps the disciples, Jesus, uh, the triune Godhead. Uh, and we won't look back, but you can look back at John 1, uh, 30 to 34 and uh, see that, uh, that uh, he's the pre-existent son of the living God. The Father told him that. Jesus pre-existed in heaven uh, with God and being with God, uh, saw everything there and came down to earth while remaining in heaven. All right, so now we come back to ye. I can see uh, already it just dawned on me I forgot to change these to the back black background, so hopefully you guys did what I said in the email and printed them out because maybe these are harder to read than usual. Uh, I, I usually put it to a black background. Sorry about that. But ye, and now it's the you all, the religious leaders as a group. All Israel as a group rejected them. Uh, we are offering uh, you something to see and they can't see it. And of course, why can't they see it? We just did that in the chart. Uh, they can't see it because they don't believe in his name. They don't see it because of unbelief. They don't see it because they're not the born ones of God, because they're not uh, believing in his name.
and they're rejecting it. Jesus coming along now and says, we're offering you uh, Israel's long prophesied kingdom and you are rejecting it. And he's telling Nicodemus, see this is, when you get down to verse 16, this is a great rebuke and a re reproof of Nicodemus. You guys got to get with the program. You got to get with the program. I've come to accomplish these things. You, what you've been reading in Ezekiel 36 and 37 your whole life, I've come to start accomplishing. And you're not receiving it. Let's look at the next verse, verse at the end of verse uh, 11 here. And ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? Uh, and so uh, they weren't receiving it. Uh, John the Baptist, the Fa God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist, the disciples, uh, they all saw things. But the bulk of the nation of Israel and the bulk of that religious system isn't seeing it. And therefore they can't receive it because they don't. And why can't they receive it? I look at verse if I, 12. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, they don't believe it. And remember the whole chain of events, what's the starting point of everything? The starting point is believing in his name. That makes you, that makes them a child of God, a born one of God's. Born ones of God have spiritual eyes to see the king in the kingdom. And that will give them the longing to enter the kingdom and, make, and partic fully participate in Israel's national restoration. And here's Jesus proclaiming these things and they, the bulk of the nation doesn't mean every single individual in that group. It just means the group as a whole uh, is not seen because they're not believing. So they don't receive it uh, because they don't believe it. Uh, and so uh, they are seeking the kingdom uh, without the righteousness of God and it just won't work. Uh, you look at Matthew 6, well, we'll just read it here. Matthew 6, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. The things of the kingdom will be added. You seek ye first, uh, it says here, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, that's the starting point. It's the righteousness. They were trying to seek the kingdom of God based on their own righteousness. Uh, they're supposed to seek it based on God's righteousness. Remember, it's the simplest thing. Anyone can understand it. That's why God put it in, in Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and God counted his faith for righteousness. God's righteousness. That's the first step of everything. Uh, even in the dispensation of grace. That's the first step. That's the first step of every fallen human born since uh, the fall of uh, Adam. Uh, God gives them a message. God confronts them with good news. And when they believe it, God counts their faith for righteousness. Now the good news changes, the programs change, but the pr basic principle, believing God and his word, God counts the faith for righteousness. You become a participant in God's righteousness. You're brought into God's righteousness. Uh, and, they, and the first step is that. That's believing in his name. That's what justifies uh, you, justifies the Israelite before God. Uh, remember when he said believing in his name, he, you know, we think, he, well, Jesus at a conference, he had a name tag with J-E-S-U-S -S on it, and they believed he was who he was. That's not at all what this is talking about. That, uh, if you talk to an ancient Israelite about the name, the only name he's going to come up with is the I am Jehovah God. God, the whole, I am Jehovah name God of Israel. The name given to Israel at their first birth, the first Exodus. Uh, and that's what they're, and that's what he, the Lord, the I am Jehovah God of Israel name. And uh, when it says they believed on his name, they believed that he is the embodiment of the, uh, of the I am Jehovah God of Israel. And that's the beginning point. That's the point at which God counts their faith for righteousness, brings them into his righteousness. Now he can do something with them. Now he can ask them to do things for him. Now he can work in and through them. Now he can, uh, he can uh, 
he can protect them and save them and deliver them and all that other stuff. That's the beginning point of everything. They were seeking uh, to their own righteousness when they should have been seeking God's righteousness. Go see this. Paul even says when he's explaining about the fall of Israel, go to Romans 10. Romans 10 verse 3. Here he gives the whole problem. Uh, what was Israel's, why did Israel fall? Verse 10, uh, chapter 10, Romans 10, verse 3. For they, this is Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They weren't, in other words, in the light of what we, way I've been describing it, they uh, haven't been starting at the starting block. They think that they're qualified to see and enter the kingdom just because, that they're, that they're automatically qualified to see and enter the kingdom just because they're the natural progeny of Adam, Adam, excuse me, Abraham through the line of Isaac and Jacob according to the flesh, just the natural progeny of Abraham. And both John the Baptist in Matthew 3 and Jesus here and then uh, in chapter 5 and chapter 8, over and over again, he's going to say that's not enough. There's another way, another qualification, another thing you need to be qualified to see and enter the kingdom. Uh, and that is you have to follow in the spiritual steps of Abraham by believing God. And God counts your faith for righteousness. Uh, and you participate in his righteousness, then you become a child of God. It's not because it doesn't come from natural. He's going to say here, uh, we read this, what's flesh is flesh, what's spirit is spirit. You have to be born of the flesh through the line of Abraham to be a true an Israelite, of course. But more importantly, that Israelite born according to the flesh through Abraham uh, needs to be born also a child of God by believing God and his word and God counting his faith for righteousness. That's what's missing. They're not believing. They're trying to enter the race as someplace else other than the starting block. And what John the Baptist and Jesus are explaining to national Israel, especially that religious system, is that uh, they think they're automatically qualified to enter the kingdom when in fact they're automatically disqualified because of unbelief. And that's what he's going to uh, talk about here. Everything uh, begins with believing God and his word, which brings them into a right relationship with God, after which God uh, works in and through them accomplishing his plan. Remember Abraham, uh, just before he starts fulfilling all the promises and doing a bunch of stuff with Abraham, what happens first? First Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and God counted his faith for righteousness. Then God made a covenant with them. Then God uh, fulfilled his promise about Isaac. Then God gave him circumcision. Then God said he could be a picture uh, by offering up his son at Mount Moriah of what he's, God himself is going to do with his son 2,000 years later uh, at Mount Calvary. Uh, and then he could do all this. Well, it's the same thing with Israel. God can't work with them until they believe. First, they have to believe and God count their faith for righteousness. Uh, and then God can work with them. Then they can do something. Then he can work in and through them. Then they can enter the kingdom, participate in Israel's national salvation. They thought they were automatically qualified. And in fact, they're automatically disqualified because they're trying to enter the race at the wrong point. Abraham believed God. All right. Uh, if I have tried explaining these things using earthly terminology, let's go read verse 12 here again. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you heavenly things? So he's been telling them uh, all these earth, using earthly terminology, birth, water, wind, uh, from the scriptures. We already looked at that, the Passover account, the Exodus account, the entrance in the land account, uh, the, the Psalms, uh, uh, Isaiah 60, uh, 66, 9, about the, the, it, the nation needs, will be, needs to be born again and it's going to occur, it's going to seem so fast like in a day. Uh, Ezekiel 36 and 37, uh, all those things about Israel needs to be born again. 
the nation needs to be born again. He's been using this earthly terminology uh, through all that. And he's taking them from scriptures that they already had on the earth. Nicodemus knew all these scriptures. He may not have known them rightly, but he would have known the scriptures. Uh, and that's why Jesus is leading him through this step by step. Uh, and it sounds so foreign to us because you see, we don't know the scripture. So how, you know, we tend to say, I even had a couple of people write, how could, Nick, how could we know any of that? Well, if you don't know your Old Testament scriptures, you know, the answer is you can't. You're not going to know it. Uh, but the point here is Nicodemus would have known it. Uh, Jesus is leading him by the hand, step by step, through Israel's national salvation program. Uh, and he's doing it, I believe, uh, as he says there in verse 10. Verse 10, it says, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Uh, that's a, a question, but it's also, uh, are, you a, are you the master of Israel? Aren't you? He's, I think he's hoping Nicodemus is in a position now uh, to go and teach others what Jesus just taught him. Lead others step by step through what Jesus just led him step by step with uh, so that he could go and teach and convert his fellow Pharisees who could go and teach and convert uh, the rest of the religious leaders who could go and convert Jerusalem, who could go and convert Judea, who could go and convert Galilee, who could go and convert Samaria so that all Israel would be saved, would be uh, taught and converted. And now God could use the nation of Israel to take his name out to the rest of the world, saving the world. That's the salvation uh, John is talking about uh, when he, he's talking about this a little later on. So uh, how is he going to be able to talk about uh, the heavenly things, his deity, his incarnation ministry, his glorification through death, resurrection, exaltation, uh, and second coming, etc. cetera? Uh, how could they be ready for all that? Uh, it's interesting. I think this, there's a key thing here that is often missed. As a matter of fact, I don't know anyone else that's really mentioned it uh, or the significance of it anyhow, is that unlike the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John never mentions the kingdom to an Israelite again through this whole long book. He doesn't mention the kingdom. Why not? Well, because uh, the problem with Israel uh, when Jesus is there isn't that they needed to see and, and enter the kingdom. What the bigger, more fundamental problem is they needed to start at the starting point. They needed to believe in his name, the I am Jehovah name of Israel, of uh, God, uh, Jehovah God of Israel. Uh, and so he's going to focus on the believing concept believing, 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 uh, because that's the starting point. John's going to try and get them to all get on the starting block so that when they take off, they'll be able to see the kingdom, they'll be able to enter the kingdom, they'll be able to participate in the full restoration of the kingdom, just as what Jesus has led them through here, step by step, through the first half of chapter 3 here. They were uh, only worried about losing their place in Rome's earthly kingdom, and I guess, and you could add in there, Satan's earthly kingdom. Let's look at an example of this. Go to John 11. John 11, verse 47. John 11, verse 47. Uh, here, they're pl uh, this is right after the resurrection, uh, re it's really not a resurrection, more of a re resuscitation of Lazarus. Uh, and they're all upset that he raised him from the dead. They're worried about it. Uh, and look at verse 47. This is John 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do, we, what do we? For this man doeth many signs. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and the nation. Now, isn't that ironic? Because uh, we've already read in Matthew that someone else has already taken the kingdom and the nation away from them. Uh, go to Matthew. Matthew, I think it's 21. Matthew 21. And let's read this. Keep your finger in John 3. We're going right back. Matthew 21. Look down at verse 43. 
Here he's talking to the religious leaders again. And look what it says in verse 43. Therefore, uh, I, I guess begin at, uh, yeah, I guess we'll begin at verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away, taken from you and given to the nation, bringing forth fruits thereof. Uh, see, they were worried that Rome was going to come and take their little bit in the Roman kingdom away from them. Uh, what they should have been worried about is their participation in God's kingdom and that God would remove them, uh, would remove the kingdom and the nation from them, his kingdom and nation from them. Here they're worried about remaining participants in Rome's earthly kingdom when they should have been worried about remaining participants in God's kingdom. It just shows you uh, the irony here, uh, how that all plays together. They should have been looking for the heavenly kingdom of God promised to establish uh, for them on earth ever since, uh, you know, go back to Abraham and really you could go back to Adam. Uh, but it all has to start with God's righteousness and faith. That's the starting point. If they refuse to start at the starting point, they're automatically disqualified. And the great satanic deception is, is because they're the children of, they, Satan has got them to think just because they're the physical descendants of Abraham, just because they have circumcision, they have the law, that they're automatically the children of God and will see and enter the kingdom. But just, Jesus and John the Baptist and uh, the disciples are going to come along and say, no, that's not the case. If you don't start at the starting block of faith, of believing, uh, then you're automatically disqualified. And that's what they were missing. And that's what John's going to plumb on about is the believing aspect, the believing aspect, the believing, that get them to get back to this, not get back, they were never there, but to get to that starting block, start off from the right point. God, uh, God through Moses promised them the days of heaven on earth, a kingdom of God uh, and heaven that gets established on earth. Let's look at a couple of those verses because uh, it's important to realize uh, because historic Christianity has so misused this passage, this kingdom of God uh, is not some spiritual kingdom, something in your heart or some a heavenly thing or something in the heavenlies. Uh, it's from heaven. It's created in heaven. It's come up with in heaven. But let's look at a couple passages and see how this plays out. Uh, De Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 11.21. This is the Deuteronomy, of course, means the second giving of the law, and he's giving the commands, commandments uh, and warnings. Deuteronomy 11.21. And here he's, he's telling them that your days may be multiplied. They obey the, 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 the law uh, and follow God's commandments. Verse 21, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them. Now that's the land that Abraham walked around. A literal, physical, real land in the Middle East uh, that Abraham could actually with his feet touching the ground walk around the perimeter of it and go back and forth over it. Uh, and look how he describes it as the days of heaven upon the earth. It's a heavenly kingdom, it's the kingdom of heaven, but it's established, it's a kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven, but it's established on the earth. That's God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel to reestablish his glory over the earth. That's not our program as, as Ephesians. So clearly we on Sunday we're kind of interesting. We're on the opposite end of this with a whole different program that we're involved with, God's mystery program for the body of Christ to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. Here, uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus about a real, physical, literal, earthly kingdom. Uh, it's a, originated in heaven. It comes from heaven. It's God's heavenly ways, but they're carried out on the earth. Let's look at another example. Go to Daniel. Daniel 2. Daniel 2, verse 44. Daniel 2, verse 44. Uh, and in the days of these kings, and we're not going to go into the details, I just want to see, show you how he describes the kingdom. Uh, the God of heaven set up a kingdom. 
It's the God of heaven, but it's the kingdom on earth. These other kingdoms that's going to replace are earthly kingdoms, which shall never be destroyed. Uh, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's going to be an, a kingdom of God that's going to destroy all uh, the kingdoms of the earth and be set up on the earth. Go to Deut or, uh, Daniel 7. One last thing here. Daniel 7, verse 13. This is our son of man, and it's interesting. The next two verses uh, in our passage in John 3 are going to refer to the son of man. Here we have him. Verse 13. I saw the, in the night vision, and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That's the kingdom Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about. Uh, the long prophesied, literal, physical uh, kingdom of Israel on earth. Uh, it originates with God. It's uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about uh, well, the, that what we call that Lord's Prayer, that the, uh, I, now I can't think of the exact words, but that God's will would be carried out on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, and that's what he's talking about, that earthly kingdom uh, set up uh, that he promised going all the way back to Moses, all the way back to Abraham, really all the way back to Adam. Verse 14. Verse 13. I guess we got to look at verse 13. Very important verse here for a couple reasons. Verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, uh, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. There we just read Son of Man in Deuteronomy, uh, excuse me, Daniel 7. Son of Man which is in heaven. Uh, and so there, uh, here we have that Son of Man, uh, and uh, it's interesting that he's the only one that's ascended up to heaven. Uh, now we could think of, who is it, uh, Enoch and Elijah. Uh, is this contradicting this? Well, no, e Enoch and Elijah, they were, didn't really ascend through their own power anyway. Uh, they were taken up. The Lord took them up. Uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man here, he has the power to, through his own power, to ascend up in the heaven. He doesn't need to be taken up. Uh, he just ascends into the heavens. He's the only one uh, that can do that, that's come down from heaven and can ascend to heaven. No man hath ascended up to, up to heaven uh, except him, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. See, now there, he, that's an awkward statement, isn't it? How can the Son of Man have left heaven to come down to earth and yet at the same time be in heaven? Well, of course, it's impossible for finite humans, uh, but this Son of Man isn't a finite human. He's God Almighty. Uh, and, of course, God is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipower, om, om powerful, all-powerful. Uh, and uh, he, came, he can come down in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in his relationship with humanity. Remember, uh, we said Son of Man and Son of God. The very next verse, or two verses, you're going to have the Son of God. Uh, and here you have the Son of Man. When it's talking about that, it's talking about God the Son, especially in relationship uh, and uh, carrying out things in relation to men, humans. Uh, son of God is especially in his relationship and carrying out things of God. Uh, so you get the two different characteristics here. Uh, and this son of God, the son, when he took on humanity, he's that, uh, that son of man in relationship with humanity. Uh, and operating in that accord, uh, he left the heavens, but he's still in the heavens. Of course, that's an uh, aspect of the deity of Christ. So John, uh, John 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man uh, be lifted up. So now we're, we're progressing along through here. He's t telling them, uh, telling Nicodemus, he's gone through Israel's national salvation package, step by step by step, leading them into that kingdom. 
uh, participating in restored nation of Israel. But the problem is uh, the ones who can see, the triune Godhead, John the Baptist, the disciples, uh, Jesus, the ones who can see are proclaiming these things and the nation as a whole is rejecting them. The nation as a whole can't see it, therefore they can't receive it, and they can't receive or see it because they don't believe. That's the problem. So now you get to the next thing, and he says, so what God did, uh, he could have just come back and destroyed you all, but what he did, remember, and this is going to come up in a few verses, the grace resident in his Jehovah name, instead of coming down in wrath and judgment to destroy him, he came down, made a plan, and came down uh, to uh, to show mercy to them, to make himself known to them, to give them the opportunity to respond positively to the grace resident in his Jehovah name. Remember that Jehovah name, it reverses the order of the law. The law says for those in rebellion against God, you just go down and destroy them. If there's any left, show them some mercy. But the, his Jehovah name, his I am Jehovah name, reverses that order. He's going to go show them mercy first, the rebels' mercy first. And then based on how they respond to his mercy, he'll either, uh, if they respond positively, he'll show them more grace and mercy, like the believing remnant of Israel. If they uh, respond negatively and continue in their rebelliousness and increase in it, uh, then he goes to the second commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. And now he's going to protect his name at all costs. That's what will bring the judgment and the condemnation and the wrath. And here, in, in what he's talking about here with Nicodemus, he says, now God, based on the grace resident in his Jehovah name, has sent me down here. And what's he sent him to do? Verse uh, 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man uh, be lifted up. What the Lord did for Israel back uh, in the time of Moses uh, to heal them, heal the nation, uh, and give them uh, physical life. Here's the great news of Nicod or Jesus telling Nicodemus, God's doing the same thing now through the work of Christ, through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent the Lord Jesus Christ to be held up in front of the nation of Israel so that when they believe his word, they can look on him and be healed and not just be given physical life, like back in the days of Moses from the bites of the serpent, but be given eternal life. And that's, he builds through here and he's bringing this out. He's step by step. God, your unbelief now, that's why God sent the Son, the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God embodied himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and came uh, not to destroy the, his enemies, but to save and to uh, proclaim grace and mercy to his enemies. Ultimately, he's going to destroy his enemies. But first, he's coming in grace and mercy. And he's offering them all who believe, uh, just like with Moses, when you believe God and his word, uh, the people looked at the serpent on the pole and they were healed and, and restored to physical life. So too, now he's telling, he says, Nicodemus, I know you know that story. Now that's what God's doing here with me. He sent me to lift me up in front of the nation of Israel so that the nation of Israel could believe God and his word and look on me and I will heal you. And not just give you physical life, give you eternal life. His point is Nicodemus, get with the program here. Uh, Moses lifted up the serpent that was afflicting them in the wilderness so that all who believed God and his word, recognizing their sin and looking at it, uh, would be healed and given physical life. Maybe it would be a good idea to go look at that just in the final few minutes here. Go to Numbers. Like Numbers uh, chapter 21. And let's just look, read the couple of verses with this short uh, account here. They're marching through the wilderness. They're heading towards the promised land. Uh, they've been wandering. Uh, 
and uh, he's leading them that way. Let's look, begin at chapter 21, verse 5. Uh, and here we have this serpent, the story of the serpent. Let's look what the people were doing. Verse 5, Numbers 21, 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Uh, sound like some things going on in uh, our gospel accounts. Wherefore, have ye brought, why have you brought us up out of the Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul lo loatheth this light bread, the manna. Uh, so they're complaining, they're rebellious. They'd rather go back to Egypt than go on with the Lord. And the Lord sent fiery serpents, verse 6, among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore... Uh, the, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Notice, they recognize they have sinned. Uh, and it's, notice it's we. It's the nation as a whole. The whole nation is coming and saying the nation as a whole has sinned uh, against the Lord and against the pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, who, uh, when he looketh upon it, shall live, shall be restored uh, to physical life. Uh, and so uh, the, the story here is they're afflicted with the snakes. The snakes are biting them, and they're poisonous, uh, and the people die. But those who believe God and his word look at the serpent, look at the serpent on the pole, uh, and they're healed, and they're given physical life. Well, now fast forward 1,500 years to Nic uh, Jesus and Nicodemus, and Jesus is saying, remember that story, Nicodemus? Well, the reason God has sent the Son of Man to leave heaven and come down here and body himself into, the human, uh, into human flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is so that all those in Israel who look upon him will be healed and given eternal life. Verse uh, 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's what the nation needs to do. That's what this whole section has been leading into. He goes them step by step. The Old Testament has explained exactly how God is gonna save national Israel. But the problem is, and I come, and John the Baptist, me, uh, have come along, and we're telling you this, but you're not receiving our message because you don't believe. But this is one of those times when, uh, like the time when the serpents bit uh, and uh, you look on the, the, what God provided the serpent and they're healed and given physical life. He's, and Jesus is saying, that's what God's doing now. He sent me to be held up before Israel so that all who look upon me will be healed and not just given physical life, given eternal life. So too now the, the, uh, they had to look at what was afflicting them, uh, the snakes back in the ancient days. What was ultimately afflicting Moses, or excuse me, the nation of Israel back in Moses' day? It wasn't really the snakes, right? Uh, it was the Lord who sent the snakes. Well, it's the same thing now, except now the Lord himself is present. The Lord himself is the one that's to be looked at. Uh, and he's now present. Remember, this is the fifth course of punishment. Who's brought this fifth course of punishment uh, onto Israel? Well, of course, it's Israel's sin is what brought it on. They could have avoided it if they returned to God and repented and returned to the Lord uh, in faith. But they didn't, and that brought on that fifth course of punishment. Uh, and who is afflicting them in the fifth course of punishment? The, ba the Assyrians thought it was uh, the Assyrians. Uh, the Babylonians thought it was the Babylonians. The Assyrians thought, we're such a great, powerful nation. We overcame, and our gods are so powerful, we overcame Israel and the Israel's gods. The Babylonians, they thought, huh, we, our gods must be stronger than Israel's gods because we overpowered them. And you know what happened to Assyria, and you know what happened to Babylon? They were both destroyed. Once the Lord, because we know that the Lord, it wasn't Babylon's strength or Assyria's strength, the Lord called Assyria to take away the northern nation. The Lord called Babylon to take away the, the southern kingdom. 
and actually you read, I think it's Habakkuk, they, it's, a hor it, it's kind of a horrifying account where he says he hissed and he drew the Babylonians to come and uh, remove Israel from the land. He made a hissing sound, kind of like a snake, hissed and they came and took him away. When he was done with them, he destroyed them especially if they thought that they did it on their own, through their own power. Uh, and so now in this fifth course of punishment, uh, ultimately it's the Lord that's afflicting them. The Lord has now come, the Lord is now being held up, and all in Israel who believe God and his word look upon him and they'll be healed, they'll be restored, they'll receive eternal life, they then will have eyes, will be the children of God, have eyes to see the kingdom uh, and be empowered and invited to enter the kingdom and participate in Israel's full national salvation. And that's where we'll end it for tonight. And then next time we'll get down into uh, verses uh, 15, 16 and following. Let's close with a word of prayer.